Welcome to all those now joining this broadcast. This is the Overcomer now live via Periscope. I pray you all will be in tune in and be blessed by this brief message dealing on the pure in heart and that what does it mean to be pure in heart and how do we can have this experience of drawing closer unto God even in the process of sanctification and true honor and true purification of the both mind and heart and soul and spirit. Amen. And at this time, you can, at this time, share this with your followers and share via Facebook and Twitter as you get right into the message of being pure in heart, the sixth beatitude on, from the Sermon on the Mount, and also continuing in the series of the beatitudes. Amen. Greetings, Sister Karen, and all those joining the scope. And let us, at this time, as always, we have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin in our message. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask at this time that your Holy Spirit may be in our midst as we, as we deal and expound on the sixth beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount, the pure in heart. What does it mean to be pure in heart? And how will we have this experience of, of being one with thee? And yea, even to have the experience of seeing thee, even in our lives and here in this present world. I pray that the words that shall be spoken be not from my own understanding, but from the understanding of your Holy Word. And though all may see it and, and understand, and yea, even surrender all their hearts unto thee, and I pray that I too will do likewise. Please, Lord, speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the Bible, it's, so let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 5, as we, as we went to our pre, in our previous scopes, in our previous um, series, Matthew chapter 5, as we deal now on the sixth beatitude, the pure in heart. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn and study with me. If not, take heed and listen what the Spirit saith unto your heart. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 8, the Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So first we'll deal on the first phrase of being pure of the, about the pure in heart. What does it mean to be pure in heart? First of all, let's, let's deal on the word pure or this adjective pure. The word pure does not only mean, as we all know it, from a human standpoint, you know, being clean, being un, untainted by the, the immorality of the world. Yes, it does mean pure in that sense, but it also means to be, un, it also means to be um, sanctified and to be pure. And to be holy and yea, to be to be purified from all sin, from all uncleanness, and from all unholiness. And also mean to be unmixed by unnecessary material and even with a substance that will make it unpure. And those of us who study well in the Bible, we all understand that sin is what causes us to be impure in all aspects of our lives. Amen. So now we need to dig deep into this, into studying the characteristics of the pure in heart that we may, we may understand how is it that they be, being become pure in heart because this is, does not happen by chance or by accidents. There is a process in being pure in heart. Let's dig deep into this. Turn me to the book of Psalm 24. Psalm the 24th division in verse number 4 and also verse number 3 for context. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4 is where we'll go to. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. The Bible tells us, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? The answer is given in verse number 4. He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. In other words, when it says that he has not lifted up his soul into vanity, in other words, it means that his mind and his affections are not lifted up or being proud spirited. He's not, he does not think proud spirited thoughts and he does not do anything for the sake of vainglory or for outward show. He does it all to the glory of God, having clean hands or having clean actions, doing what is right in the sight of God and in the sight of man, having a pure heart. And a heart does not only mean having 
a pumping heart, it also means the mind. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, he that th whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, talking about the mind, because the thoughts is resounding in the mind. The, the affections and the feelings come forth from the heart, which pumps forth all the blood and that circulates the, the blood throughout our veins th in our bodies. Amen. So the pure in heart are the ones that have clean hands and a pure mind, thinking thoughts that are pure, and that whatsoever they do, they do all to reflect the, the perfect character of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's dig deeper. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 26. Proverbs 15 and verse 26. Proverbs 15 and verse 26. So now they have a, they have clean actions. In other words, their actions are pure. They are not worldly. They do nothing to break God's holy law, but they do all in obedience to the commandments of God. So let's see in Proverbs chapter, actually not chapter, mm, not at chapter, yes, it is chapter 15 and verse number 26. I gave the right text. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 26 says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. So the, the words of the pure are pleasant words. What are the effects of, ha of speaking pleasant words? Chapter 16, of verse 24 says that pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. But how is it that they are speaking Pleasant words. Let's turn to our next text. Psalm 119, verse 140. Psalm 119 and verse number 40. Greetings, brother. Welcome. Psalm 119, verse 140. Tells us this specific truth concerning the purity of words and also the thoughts. Psalm 119, verse 140 tells us this. It says, thy word, talking about the, the word of God, is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. Now turn to the same text, the same chapter, 119, but this time verse number 11. The Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So the pure in heart speak words that are pleasant, or in other words, that are undefiled, that are sweet, that do not cause any harm physically and spiritually and mentally as a result of thinking thoughts that are pure, which comes about by meditating on the Word of God. Because the Word of God is pure, it is holy, it is untainted by the opinions and the false doctrines of men. But once we hide it in our hearts or in our minds, reside it in our thoughts, what we think will be pure, and what we speak as a result of what we think in our minds will be pure. Because the mind and the heart are connected together, as Christ says in Matthew chapter 12, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But we have many of us, God's oppressed people, speaking words that are unholy, that are unsanctified. How so? Because we have not hid God's word in our hearts or in our minds that we may not sin against him, nor grieve his Holy Spirit. But now that we grieve God's Holy Spirit, we grieve our fellow men and thus cause a separation that is not necessary, that will cause wounds, the divisions, and separations that cause further harm and damage to many people in the world, all because of the unsanctified heart and the unsanctified mind. Christ says clearly, blessed are the pure in heart. In contrast, cursed are those whose hearts are not pure, whose words are not pure, and whose thoughts are not on God, but on self and on the things of the world, yea, even on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we can just think logically. Let's put this into, into practical sense. How can you think thoughts or I should say pure thoughts, if you're watching secularism on television or on video games or even on movie theaters or anywhere you go, 
either on DVDs, whatever movies that you have in your in your in your house or in your room, in your bedroom, your living room, what what you watch with your own eyes, with your own vision, which ought not to behold iniquity and sin, it will right away be lodged in your mind, and what you continually think about will be carried out not only through your words, but also through your actions. Through your actions. And this is how we have come about even today. But we need not despair because we do not have the actual strength to overcome sin and to live in harmony with the word of God. But we can day by day, even right now, surrender our lives unto the Lord and give that which belongs to him. Amen. Now, let's turn to our next text as we def as we go deeper into the characteristics of the godly, the pure in heart. Job chapter 16, verse number 17. Job chapter 16, verse 17, because once their mind is pure or centered on God, having the word reside in the heart that they will not sin against him, it will be carried out, yea, even in the, in the, in the teachings and the doctrines in which they teach, and what they preach, and what they say, even in prayer, unto the Lord. You can take that in Job chapter 11, verse 4, in which the Bible says that my doctrine is pure. But let's turn to, to Job chapter 16, verse number 17. Amen? Job 16, verse number 17 tells us, Not for any injustice in mine hands, also my prayer is pure. See, even when we pray unto the Lord, we're not praying anything that is contrary to the will of God, but according to his will. And that what we pray, we pray not so much for us to be blessed by the Lord and all these things, but we pray for others, we intercede for others, and we pray yeah, even for, the, for Christ to abide in our hearts and for his Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. We must never pray for anything that is amiss or against the word of God. Amen. This is the these are the few characteristics. We don't have to we don't have time to go through all the scriptures, but these are the few characteristics from scripture that tells us how we become pure in heart and how we can be in this spiritual condition of being one with Christ and yea, even to be sanctified. Christ says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now we can turn back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 7. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now let's compare this to the Ark of the Covenant. As I said before, I will say it again. That each beatitude is illustrated in each apartment and instrument within the sanctuary. As it was in the early sanctuary, so it is still even right now in the heavenly sanctuary. Where Christ is, specifically in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, interceding in our behalf. As well as reviewing in the investigative judgment. Amen? So let's compare this to the Ark of the Covenant because being pure in heart has much to do with the most holy place experience. Specifically, especially on the Ark of the Covenant as, as, as it is the only instrument within the most holy place, but several items within the Ark. Amen? Now, we're, go not go we're not going to deal with all of them, but one specific um, item within the Ark of the Covenant that deals more in harmony with being pure in heart. Amen? So please bear with me. Turn to the book of Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, and we'll read a few verses that deal with the Ark of the Covenant as well as the purpose of as to why the Ark of the Covenant was constructed and was there within the most holy place. Exodus chapter 25 is where we'll go to. Amen. And let's read in verses 21 and 22. Exodus chapter 25, verses 21 and 22 says, this is God speaking unto Moses, talking about the construction and the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant within the most holy place. 
and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony, talking about the Ten Commandments, the tables of stone written by his own finger, that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So you see, the Ark of the Covenant, as clearly said in this verse, verse number 22, is where God meets with us in the most holy place on the Ark of the Covenant as his glory is revealed in the Shekinah glory between the two cherubims that are above the Ark on each side of the Ark, one on one side, another cherubim on the other side of the Ark. And we're going to dig a, a little deeper into this. And within the ark, as says in Hebrews chapter 9, I believe, that within the ark was placed the two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and the golden pot full of manna. We're not going to deal on Aaron's broad or on the golden pot, but we're going to deal on the law of God residing within the ark. And we're going to, to deal spiritually as to what the ark represents and how it applies to to each of us, yea, even the law of God being resided in the ark. Amen. So turn with me back to, to Matthew chapter 5. So as you just read, the ark of the covenant was there where God will commune with his servant. Once every year, the, the high priest was to go into the most holy place to make an atonement, not only for the sanctuary, but also for all the people of Israel because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of all the sins to which they have brought within their own selves as well as into the camp and thus causing the sanctuary to be defiled as a result of bringing the blood from the animal on which the sin was placed when the sinner was co confessing his sins over the lamb and after the lamb was slain that the blood was being brought into the tabernacle he even specifically on the altar of incense, especially once every year on the altar of incense, every year that the blood was, was to be brought onto the altar of incense and also in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, before the mercy seat and upon the mercy seat, making atonement for the children of Israel and to make intercession for those that sin against God, and also for the sanctuary to be cleansed from all the blood in which there was for all, from all the blood that was within the tabernacle, both in the mo in the holy place, in the most holy place. Amen. But we're going to dig deep as to whom the Ark of the Covenant represents and how it applies to us in these last days. So again, Matthew chapter five and verse number seven, we read, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." We understood and discovered from Scripture. That the pure in heart are those that hid the word in the heart or in the mind that they might not sin against God and in their prayers to God and what they teach are pure. They are unmixed with false doctrines and with sin and their lifestyle is in harmony with Christ. Now, did you know the word of God is also the law of God? John chapter 17 verse 17 says, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. Psalm 119 verse 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So when you connect these two scriptures together, and also other scriptures, you will understand that the word of God and the law of God are one and the same. So in other words, they were prayed, hide your law within my heart that I may not sin against you. Just like what Christ said in Psalm 40 verse 8, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law, thy word is within my heart. Amen. Once we have God's word written in our hearts and our minds, we will not have a disposition or even a desire 
to break his law, nor his heart, nor to do any evil in the sight of Christ, thus crucifying him afresh and putting him to an open shame. But if we sin, it is a result of not being pure in heart, not hiding Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and the word who is God in our hearts. They're all connected together. And and this is how the Christian life is so is so difficult and very hard to even accomplish and achieve. Many of us, and I've been that in in that position as well. Many of us we have we find it very hard to live a perfect Christian life in Christ. It is simply because we're not made full surrender of our will and of our hearts unto Christ. Our hearts are continually impure, proudful, and thus we lift our souls unto vanity or unto vainglory, being proud spirited, and we glorify not God in that manner of living. And 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 we think we and and because we have that experience, we, we right away think that God cannot accept us or He is not hearing our prayers because He does not like us or that He does not want us to be perfect. That is not true. That's a lie of the enemy himself. It's simply because of us unwilling to surrender our will and of our hearts unto the Lord. It is simply because we are not by faith walking with Christ in the most holy place. Yea, even being the spiritual ark of the covenant. Amen? So now, if we want to truly understand how we can... Be truly being pure in heart, having all these other characteristics that we have seen in Scripture, we need to understand and keep in our mind that the Ark of the Covenant represents the people of God. Did you know that? Now, the word Ark, when you look at it in the dictionary or in the Strong's Concordance, it does not only mean a box or a chest or simply a boat like, like with Noah's Ark, which he built for the sake of his house. But it also means a vessel. An ark is a vessel. Amen? And that vessel, as well as all the vessels that were in the sanctuary, good evening, represents the people of God. Let's turn to to second um to first Timothy. Let's turn to first Timothy chapter one, verse number five. But before we go we turn to first Timothy, let's, let's turn to the book of Romans, chapter nine. That's another script. That's one script that we can go to. Amen. Romans chapter nine, verses twenty-three and twenty-four. Romans chapter nine, verses twenty-three and twenty-four. There are several scriptures that tells us that a vessel represents God's people, but let's go only into one. Amen. One text can can show us, and you can look under the other the other texts in your own time. Amen. Romans chapter nine, verses twenty-three and twenty-four says. And that he might, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he had called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So the vessels represent the people of God in these last days. In these last days. We must be vessels of honor and sanctification, manifesting the glory of God, the character of God in our lives, that we may be the light of the world. Amen. Let's turn to Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-two now. Because once we become the spiritual ark or the vessel of the covenant, the law of God being resided in our hearts, in our minds then we can truly be a vessel of honor, of sanctification, as well as light in the world of darkness and, and allowing the Shekinah glory of the Heavenly Father and of Christ to shine through our lives onto all those that sit in darkness and that once they see us, they see not Philip, they see not all those that are watching this scope, any of you, whatever names you may be, they see Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that they take knowledge of us, 
that we had been with Jesus. This is the purpose of living a perfect Christian life, not to create a show or to boast of the, of the theoretical knowledge of the Bible or of the spirit of prophecy. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to do the will of God, to finish his work, and to manifest his glory to all those who, with whom we come in contact, not just of our words, but also of our actions, of our deportment, or in our conversation. And that once they see our actions being pure and holy, they will understand that our mind is centered not on the things of the world, which will pass away, but on God only and the things of heaven, which are eternal. Amen. This is what we need to make people to understand and to realize. It does not matter how many times you preach Bible prophecy or on the mark of the beast or on any prophetic um, scripture in the, in the book of Daniel or in the book of Revelation or any prophetic book of the Bible. You can do all these things and they are important. I'm not belittling, belittling that. These things are important. And it doesn't matter how much you read about the great controversy or about history of the reformers. You can do all these things. You can do works of charity, do works of kindness. You can do works of outward generosity to those that are less fortunate. You can do all these things and they're good in their proper place. But if you're not sanctified in heart, doing the will of God from your heart. As a result of hiding, hiding the word of God, which is pure and holy, as is the law of God himself, reflecting the character of God, all these things will be worth nothing. Nothing. Doesn't matter how many times, how, doesn't matter how many times you may, you may perform acts of good works or kindness or any great works. Doesn't matter how many powerful sermons that you preach from the pulpit, or if you're a pastor or an elder or a deacon, it does not matter. If your heart is unsanctified, living an unsanctified life, you are nothing and you remain nothing and you would die nothing. Nothing like dust if you're unpure and you have not Christ abiding in you. Simple as that. Amen? We must be pure in heart and as a result, be pure in lifestyle. Turn to, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. I'll allow those words to sink down in those in, in your hearts. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 tells us this, but also verse 21. Context is very important. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 21 and 22 says, If a man therefore purge himself, or in other words, purify himself, he shall be a vessel. Again, vessel. He shall be an ark. He shall be the means through which the glory of God will, will be manifested. But also being a protected vessel so that way no harm or any attack from the enemy will not come against you. Because once you have Christ in you, you are, you are, you are more powerful than that all the hosts of darkness in which they may, they may come unto you. It doesn't matter how many um, legions of angels that Satan may, may have with him. If you're abiding in Christ, doing the will of God, you are worth more than a whole army of angels, say even evil angels that may come against you to destroy you and to bring you down. Because Christ is more powerful than the enemy. Doesn't matter, doesn't, doesn't matter how many times they may do to, to hurt Christ or to attack Christ by attacking us. If we live out like the light of Christ, being Christ-like, Satan is powerless. He can do nothing to sway us or to swerve us from our duty to God and to man. But all that we can do is say, get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. For thou art an offense unto me. For, and for I love the word of God and I love Christ so much that I will do nothing to hurt him or to wound him afresh and thus cause him once again to be an open shame. Amen. This is the experience that we must have in order for us to win the battle, the spiritual battle against evil. We must be pure in heart. We must be sanctified throughout all the avenues of our lives. 
And that way we can live a victorious life and that we can live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. Don't forget that. So again, verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel or an ark unto honor, sanctified and meet or useful, in other words, for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now, once we have this experience of being pure in heart, this is how we are to react when we are tempted. This is, this is how we are to react. Notice this, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. This is how we are to react when, when Satan will present his wiles and his sophistries unto us. Anything that can beguile us into sin, into iniquity, into wickedness, and to, to, that will cause us to swerve from the narrow path of self-denial and bearing the cross of Christ. We are, to, we are to be fearful. We are to have this godly fear of breaking God's heart and pleasing the enemy. We are to, we are to be as though we are being attacked by the enemy himself when we are tempted. When the enemy comes, we are to be we are to react as if our life is at stake. Just like what just like if there's a bomb in the room and you see the bomb ticking right in your room, you are to be in this, in this emergency mode of action. That you do all that you can to get rid of the bomb and the bomb will stop ticking and thus prevent the death or the destruction of not only yourself but all those that might also be affected by a ticking bomb. This is how we are to react likewise when we are tempted to sin to break God's law. Think about the temptation as a ticking bomb. It's, it's right next to you. And you see that temptation, you are to cast it away. You are to, you are to rebuke the enemy and say, get thee hence. Amen? This is how we are to react. Once we have a true, strong, this firm love for the word of God and for his law. We can do no, no otherwise. This is a way or one of the ways in which we can overcome sin and that we can live by faith, seeking him day by day. Amen. So now let's draw this so close. So the promise is to the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does it mean to see God? It means to discern the effects of godliness, to discern Christ in the works of nature, in the beauties of creation. When you go out to nature, once you behold nature, you not only behold nature in her beauty, but also nature's God. You discern Christ, the creator of all things, the author of all creation, in nature and you and that once you see yeah, even the lovingness of Christ in his word and within his commandments and his testimonies you see yourself in the deplorable condition and that you have a more greater desire to serve him to forsake your own righteousness and to serve him better amen this is how we need to understand when it comes about being pure in heart in discerning Christ within that profession of character, yea, even in Christ, because Christ himself was pure in heart. He was pure in all his actions, in his appointments, in his conversation, and what he had done for humanity. Even though he is not literally here on earth, he is still here in our midst, especially in the midst of those, and in those, abiding in those who keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. He is still doing works of kindness to the poor and preaching the gospel to the poor and to those that are in need of salvation and preaching deliverance to the captives and restoring the sight of those that are blind spiritually and setting at liberty them that are bruised and are bound by Satan and preaching the acceptable year of the Lord and showing forth salvation through his blood and through his life. Once we have Christ in us, the word in us, the law of God in us, we can do works of righteousness with all sincerity to those 
that are in need of it. Amen? And to close off this message, I want to read to you from the book called Thoughts of the Mount of Blessing in page 27. Amen? In page 27, paragraph number 1. Page 27, paragraph number 1 says, The pure in heart live as in the visible presence of God during the time he apportions them in this world. And they will also see him face to face in the future. This is also a promise to the pure in heart. And they will also see him, okay, read that, in the future immortal state, as did Adam when he walked and talked with God in Eden. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 12. So I appeal to you and to myself as well. Will we give our hearts unto Christ and will we surrender all unto him? And being the process, as it says in First Thessalonians chapter 3, that we will do the will of God and being sanctified in our hearts, both physically, mentally, and spiritually, and that we abstain from fornication, abstain from the world, and that way there will be nothing obstructing us in living a pure life in Christ, doing His will, and that which is pleasing in the Father's sight, glorifying Christ, making Christ our true friend and our Savior and our Redeemer, or will we do what we please and live as if we have many more years to come that we can live eat and drink, and that tomorrow we die. And thus, when we do die, that we, that we, that we are lost outside of Christ, and, and we sleep in the Christless grave, and, and thus be raised up in the second resurrection instead of the first or the special resurrection. Which one will it be? Christ or nothing? The choice is yours. This is a hope. This is the whole understanding of the process of sanctification and living justly by faith and being saved by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give him your heart, for he says to you and to me, my son, my daughter, give me thine heart. Let us hearken to his appeal and we give unto him our heart and that we can mold it and shape it into his image and like like David prayed in Psalm 51, that we can pray, create within me a clean heart or a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. May this be our experience and may we continually have this experience until Christ comes again and that he can say of us, come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. May this be our experience, not just, not temporarily, but permanently abiding Christ and doing His will. Amen? Let us pray to close. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this message, and we ask at this time that we will give our hearts unto You, not just for tonight, but throughout our lives, we surrender all unto Thee. Lord, we want to be a Christian. We want to be more loving and holy, more Christ-like in our hearts, doing thy will and being sanctified and cleansed from all sin and knowing that we are to possess our bodies in sanctification and honor and thus reflecting thy character to all those that sit in darkness in ignorance. And that when they see us, they'll see Christ in us, the hope of glory, and that it will be changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by your Holy Spirit wants to see, as in the glass, your character. Please, Lord, help us even right now that we will not think or do anything that is impure, that is unholy, but only that which is pure and holy and right in your sight. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. And I pray that those who have joined in late will watch the replay and that you will be blessed and that you, we will all continually seek his face and be pure in heart. God bless and by God's grace we will meet again at the time appointed according to his will. God bless and Maranatha, the Lord is coming.